If you want to learn how to get rich investing in the stock market, Peter Lynch is someone you need to be learning from. Lynch has arguably the best track record of any stock picker that has managed large amounts of money. During his time running the famous Fidelity Magellan Fund, Lynch was able to achieve a nearly 30% annual return over a 13-year period. This is virtually unheard of in the world of professional money management. Thankfully for us, Peter was an open book with the secrets of how to invest successfully after he left the industry. I have spent countless hours studying everything Peter Lynch has ever written and every interview he has given, and I've condensed that knowledge down to the absolute six most important lessons that you need to know in order to invest successfully. All I ask for in return is for you to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel because it's my goal to help you become a better investor. Now let's get into the video. You need an edge to make money too. People have incredible edges and they throw them away. I'll give you a quick example of uh, Smith Klein. This is a stock in, that had Tagamet. Now, you didn't have to buy SmithKline when Tagamet was doing clinical trials. You didn't have to buy SmithKline when Tagamet was talked about in the New England Journal of Medicine or the British version, Lancet. You could have bought SmithKline when Tagamet first came out, a year after it came out. Let's say your spouse, your mother, your father, you were a nurse, you were a druggist, you're writing all these prescriptions. <coughs> Tagamet was doing an amazing job of curing ulcers. And it was a wonderful pill for the company because if you just stopped taking it, the ulcer came back. See, it, wasn't, it would have been a crummy product that you took it for a buck and it went away. But it was a great product for the company. But you could have bought it two years after the product was on the market and made five or six times your money. I mean, all the druggists, all the nurses, all the people, millions of people saw this product. And they're out buying oil companies, you know, or drilling rigs, you know. It happens. And then three years later, or four years later, Glaxo, even a bigger company, it's a huge company, a British company, brought out Zantac, which was a better, at that time, an improved product. And you could have seen that take market share do well. You could have bought Glaxo and triple your money. So you only need a few stocks in your lifetime. They're in your industry. I think of people, if you'd worked in the auto industry, let's say you're an auto dealer the last 10 years, you would have seen Chrysler come up in the minivan, You've seen, if you're a Buick dealer, a Toyota deal, a Honda dealer, you would have seen the Chrysler dealership packed with people. You could have made 10 times your money on Chrysler a year after the, the minivan came out. Ford introduces the Taurus Sable, the most successful line of cars in the last 20 years. Ford went up sevenfold on the Taurus Sable. So if you're a car dealer, you only need to buy a few stocks every decade. When your lifetime's over, you don't need a lot of five baggers to make a lot of money starting with $10,000 or $5,000. So in your own industry, you're gonna see a lot of stocks, and that's what bothers me. There are good stocks out there looking for you, and people just aren't listening, and they're just not watching it. And uh, they have incredible edges. People have big edges over me. <clears throat> they work in the aluminum industry. I see aluminum industries coming down, in inventories coming down six straight months. They see demand improving. In America today, you know, you know, it's hard to get an EPA permit for a bowling alley, never mind an aluminum smelter. So you know when aluminum gets tight, you just can't build seven aluminum smelters. So when, when you see this coming, you can say, wait a second, I can make some money. When an industry goes from terrible to mediocre, the stock goes north. When it goes from mediocre to good, the stock goes north. When it goes from good to terrific, the stock goes north. There's lots of ways to make money in your own industry. You can be a supplier in the industry, you can be a customer. This thing, this thing happens in the paper industry, it happens in the steel industry. It doesn't happen every week, but if you're in you're some field, you'll see a turn, you'll see something in the publishing industry. These things come along, and it, it's just mind-boggling, people throw it away. Uh, now here's a big point. Remember this one, it's futile to predict the economy, interest rates, and stock market. I mean, people keep trying to do this. I mean, this would be useful. I would love to know when we get a recession. I'd love to know when interest rates are gonna go up or down. I'd love to know when the stock market's going up. That would be helpful. I would like to get next year's Wall Street Journal. Uh, unfortunately, you don't get it. I remember in 1982, we had uh, a lot of people in this room around for 82. We had 20% uh, prime rate, 15% long governments, double digit unemployment, double digit inflation. I don't remember anybody telling me about that in 1980. I remember anybody telling me about that in 1981. But in 83, I remember they said, well, the economy's bounced back when we had a recession in 85. In 85, they said we have a recession in 86. In 87, something happened in October 87. I forget what something happened in October 87. Celtics lost seven in a row. Some, something bad in 87. They said for sure we have a recession in 88. And they said 89, for sure we'll have a recession. And then 90, we're supposed to have the so-called soft landing, which we never had. 
So I've always said if you spend 13 minutes a year on economics, you've wasted 10 minutes. In, uh, <laughs> the, uh, and uh, all you need to know about the stock market is it goes up and it goes down, and it goes down a lot. And that's all you need to know. Again, it'd be terrific to know what's going to happen to the economy, but I deal with facts. If inventories are going up, if copper prices are going down, if room occupancy is going the wrong way, people building too many hotels, I look at freight car loadings when I own railroad stocks. I deal with facts. I don't deal with people tell me something's going to happen in the future. You might as well call the psychic hotline for that stuff to, 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 to get a better average. At, uh, is a lot of times people buy on the basis the stock has gone down this much. How, you know, how much further can it go down? I remember when Polaroid went from 130 to 100. People said, here's this great company, great record. If it ever gets below 100, you know, just buy every share, you know. And it did get below 100. A lot of people bought on that basis saying, look, it's gone from 135 to 100. It's not 95, what a buy. Within a year, it was 18. And this is a company with no debt. I mean, this is a company, it was just so overpriced, it went down. Uh, I did the same thing in my, uh, I think my first or second year of Fidelity. Kaiser Industries had gone from $26 a share to 16. I said, how much lower can it go? It's 16. So I think we bought one of the biggest blocks ever on the, New York, on the American Stock Exchange of Kaiser Industries at 14. I said, you know, it's gone from 26 to 16. How much lower can it go? Well, at 10, I called my mother and said, Mom, you're going to uh, look at this Kaiser Industries. I mean, how much lower can it go? It's gone from 26 to 10. <laughs> well, it went to 6, it went to 5, it went to 4, it went to 3. And uh, now I under fortunate this happened rapidly. Or I would probably be still caddying or uh, be a bit of working at the stop and shop, but I, it happened fast. So I was able to, this, this was compressed. At, uh, and at 3, I figured out, you know, there's something very wrong here because Kaiser Industries owns... 40% of Kaiser Steel, they own 40% of Kaiser Aluminum, they own 32% of Kaiser Cement, they own Kaiser Broadcasting, they own Kaiser Santa Gravel, Kaiser Engineers, they own Jeep, they own business after business, and they had no debt. Now I learned this very early, this might be a breakthrough for some people, it's very hard to go bankrupt if you don't have any debt. It's, it's tricky, some people can approach that, it's a, real, it's a real achievement, but they had no debt, and the whole company at three was selling at about 75 million, at that point, it was equal to buying one Boeing 747. I said, there's something wrong with this company selling for $75 million. I was a little premature at 16, but uh, I said, everything's fine, and eventually this will work out. And they, what they did is they gave away all their shares to their shareholders. They, they passed out shares in Kaiser Cement. They passed out shares in Kaiser Aluminum. They passed out their public shares in Kaiser Steel. They sold all the other businesses, and you get about $50 a share. And, but if you didn't understand the company, if you're just buying on the fact the stock had gone from 26 to 16, and then it got to 10, what would you do when it went to 9? What would you do when it went to 8? What would you do when it went to 7? This is the problem that people have, is they sell stocks because they didn't know why they bought it, then it went down, and they don't know what to do now. Do you flip a coin? Do you walk around the block? You know, <laughs> what do you do? It's psychiatrists that haven't worked so far. I've never seen them running in. The, the, the psychological psychiatry fund I've never seen listed for the, uh, with the SEC to make it through as a mutual fund. So I, they haven't seemed to help. Uh, I've tried prayer, that hasn't worked. The, uh, the, uh, so if you don't understand the company, you have this problem when they go down. There's always something to worry about. Uh, if you own stocks, there's always something to worry about. You can't get away from it. Uh, what happens in the 50s, people were worried about, uh, the, the only reason we got out of the depression was World War II. We got another recession. In the early 50s, they said we're gonna go right back into a depression. People worried about a depression in the 50s and they worried about nuclear war. I mean, back then, uh, you know, the, the little warheads they had then, they couldn't blow up McLean, West Virginia, or McLean, Virginia, you know, or, or Charlestown. Now, all these countries that end in Stan, there's nine of these Stan countries that have come out of Russia, they all have enough warheads to blow the world up, and no one worries about it. When I was a kid, people were building fallout shelters, and we used to have this, this civil defense drill. Remember this one in high school? I mean, you get under your desk. I never thought even then that was a particularly good thing to do. This, you know, if they blow us, somebody put a hat, we'd all get under our desk, you know. It, uh... But in the 50s, people wouldn't buy stocks, except for the 80s. The 50s was the best decade, the century of the stock market. And people wouldn't buy stocks in the 50s because they're worried about nuclear war and they're worried about recent depression. Then people, <coughs> remember when oil went from 4 to 40 and, and it was going to go to 100 and we we're going to have a depression? Remember that one? Well, about three years later, the same experts, now higher paid, oil's now at 10, and they said it was going to go to 4 and we we're going to have a depression. And then the Japanese, remember how the Japanese were going to own the world? Remember that one? And that we're going to have a depression? 
And then about two years later, we're all worried about Japan collapsing. And this is the most absurd thing I've ever heard. There's a company with a 20% savings rate, incredible workforce, incredible productivity. And people are saying we're going to have a depression because Japan's going to collapse. And they had, you know, on their prayer list, they load Mother Teresa and crippled children, and they were praying for Japan at night. You know, you know, you know it's unbelievable. I mean, it, the, the LDC debt. Remember the LDC debt? Remember that one? All these countries, all Chase had lent their net worth to Brazil, Chile, Peru, and all these other countries, and so had and all the other countries. And LD said they were not going to pay it back, and we we're going to have a depression. It always ends, and we're going to have a depression. Or the Great Depression. We're going to have the Great Depression. I never could quite understand that adjective in front of depression, but, the, uh, but the Great Depression is, oh, the big one. The big one's coming. But all these countries, and now I understand, you know, these are called the, then they were called less developed countries. Now, we used to call them underdeveloped countries. Those are all wrong terms. Those are not politically correct. You have to call these emerging countries. You can't use less developed or underdeveloped because that's, in fact, the other day I heard the, politically correct term for something that's overweight is laterally challenged. That's the, uh, the uh, that's a, and so they're always something to worry about. When you were actively managing money, you presumably were under the same pressures as other fund managers to show performance results. Right. Did that incline you to sell too quickly sometimes? Well, I think my greatest mistakes are, I mean, you know, it's, it's funny on a stock, all you can lose is 100%. I've done that. But your great mistakes is selling a good company and then it doubles, then it triples and quadruples because you make a lot of mistakes. And so it's ones that go up tenfold, I call them the ten baggers. So some of my mistakes are just saying, oh my God, this stock is too high. And I was wrong. And you had to figure out what inning am I in this baseball game? I sold Toys R Us way too early. It went up twentyfold after I sold. I did the same thing at Home Depot. Those are probably my two greatest mistakes I ever made. When should you sell? Well, you ought to find out why you bought a stock. If you're saying if it's a cyclical company and they're doing poorly and they're doing awful, you wait till things are getting better and they're doing terrific and then you sell it. But with a growth company, you have to say, Walmart's case, 10 years after they went public, you could have bought the stock and made 500 times your money. You say, still are only in 15% of the United States. And you, they could say, why can't they go to 17? Why can't they go to 19? Why can't they go to 23? So for the next four decades, they went around the country. So you have to say to yourself, in this stock, I have a 10-year story, a 20-year story. I'll be able to write that down and follow that. That's what I do with the company. And that's your decision. That's how you sell it. So I have no idea when the market's going to go down and uh, no idea when it's going to go up. I'm totally shocked the market was 4,000. Two and a half years ago, a little while ago, it's 8,000. Uh, I had no idea about this. Uh, very surprising to me. But I'll guarantee you the market will be a lot higher in 15 years. It'll be a lot higher in 25 years. What it's going to do in the next one or two years, I don't have any idea. And if somebody in this room knows about it, they're not telling anybody. <laughs> or they're not in this room. They're down in Palm Springs somewhere. You know, the, they've made a billion dollars. Or if they know anything about interest rates. Because in interest rates, if you can be right five times in a row in 10 grand, you can have two billion. It's not that many people with two billion. There's a lot of people predicting interest rates. Did you ever think about that one? <laughs> the, uh, just five times right in a row in 10 grand. Two billion. It, uh, if you write seven times in a row, you can have the GNP of, uh, you know, the United Kingdom. You know, it's a big number. It, uh, uh, so I don't worry about that. I know we've had uh, 96 years of century, and the market's fallen 53 times. We've had 53 declines of 10% or more. So 53 declines in 96 years. Once every two years, we have a 10% decline. Of the 53 declines, 15, one five, have been 25% or more. So 15 in 96 years, about once every six years, the market falls 25% or more. That's what we call a bear market, you know, you know that. And it's going to happen. It's, I don't care when it's going to happen. I would love to know. I, obviously, it would be very useful to know when it's going to happen. It doesn't make a difference to me. Corporate profits will be a lot higher eight years from now, a lot higher 16 years from now, a lot higher 30 years from now. That's what I deal with. So there we have it. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you enjoyed the video. Make sure to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel because our community of investors is approaching 200,000 people strong and it would be even better with you as a part of it. Talk to you guys again soon.